everybody, if you could mute your mics for me, if you haven't already. Mm -hmm. All right, great. That's just to prevent background noise. Hi, everybody. My name is Ann Vota. I am the Director of Health and Wellness at the Center for Adults Living Well at the YMHA of Washington Heights and Inwood. And I am so excited today to see you for a virtual visit in Fort Tryon Park. I'm so excited that I'm donning my favorite garden hat. And I was just rereading some of Leslie Day's wonderful books. She's written several books about New York City and nature. And I've even started hanging out with a group of birders in the morning. And I would like to introduce you to Leslie Day, who is the author of many, bo many books about nature. She's also a friend. She's also a member of the Senior Center at the Y. Welcome, Leslie. I am. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hold up that book again. Hold up that tree book. So the artist who did all the leaves and drawings in the book, Trudy Smoke, is also with us today. Uh, she's a participant. Um, okay, well, today we're going to tour the Heather Garden. And um, the naturalist Mike Feller once said that the Heather Garden is New York City's most beautiful work of art because it has a palette of colors that shine throughout the four seasons. Um, right now, during the pandemic, all of the other botanical gardens are locked up. You can't walk through them. You can't walk through the Brooklyn Botanic Garden or the New York Botanical Garden, but the Heather Garden is open 365 days a year. Um, and people are wearing masks and social distancing, but we're able to find a spot where there's so much beauty during this terrible time. Um, let me just see here now. Oh, here we go. Uh, so John D. Rockefeller Jr. is the person that's responsible for building Fort Tryon Park. When he was a little boy, um, in the 1800s, the mid to late 1800s, he would explore the woods. He loved the views of the Hudson. And um, at the turn of the century, people started selling their land. This is a view north. This is Broadway. These are the hills of Fort Tryon Park. This is the Billings Estate. Uh, and these are smaller uh, plots owned by individual people. And he started buying up parcels. And eventually, CKG Billings sold, was selling his 25 acres. And we talked about him uh, last week and the week before, but this is a view of his estate. And when he built it, he, he built his, his home, Tryon Hall, <laughs> on top of the hill with views of the Hudson. And he had to figure out a way to get a driveway up to the house and, and up there, it's over 200 feet from the Hudson River. So it was too steep for horses and carriages and later automobiles, of course. So a neighbor had an idea. He brought a cow over and he said, let's see if she can find the easiest way up, which she did. And the route she took, and back then this was Riverside Drive and, and it later became the Henry Hudson Parkway. She took this route and walked, and you can see the rock wall is still there today, and she walked this way. So they mapped out her route and they built the driveway. Now, of course, this is all still standing, um, the Billings Arcade. So this is a view of it. I think I took this maybe two days ago. Um, and Inside, it says, we only hang the chandeliers on special occasions, one of those funny signs that they've recently put up. But this is what it looked like, and th these were the chandeliers. So if you look today, of course, um, the structure is still beautiful. There are no more chandeliers. But if you look down, you will see the red brick driveway that Billings installed. It cost him a quarter of a million dollars to build this entranceway to his estate. And he had thousands of bricks manufactured. And each one is beveled so that when the horses go up or down, they get a sure footing on the driveway. This is a view of Fort Tryon Park looking east from the Hudson. 
And this is a view looking west at the Palisades. So a lot of people all often ask, well, what is that beautiful building across the river? That is St. Peter's College. Let me just open this up a little bit. Um, and it just brings to mind that not only did uh, Rockefeller build Fort Tryon Park, but he put his money into preserving the Palisades because at the time, there were quarries up and down the river, and they were quarrying the basalt rock that makes up the Palisades to, be, to create cobblestones for New York City. And the Women's Historical Society in New Jersey was fighting to protect the Palisades, and Rockefeller gave them a lot of money to support their lawsuits. And they, of course, were eventually successful. And then he personally bought a property and, and, and uh, supported the building of the Palisades Interstate Park and Parkway. He hired uh, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted's sons, who were landscapers, to landscape the park, to landscape the Heather Garden, and the Alpine Garden. And here when they were building it in 1930, 31, they actually moved enormous elm trees uh, to line the promenade. And this is what it looks like today, you know, 90, 80 years later. Um, and of course, uh, last week or the week before I talked about Dutch elm disease and how Dutch elm disease has been killing tens of millions of elms in the United States. And the park for Tryon Park Trust is raising money to inoculate the elms uh, to keep them healthy so they are not afflicted with Dutch elm disease. When you're, let me just reduce this. I see that. When, you, when you're looking north, when you come out of the subway and you're on Fort Washington Avenue and you're looking north, you see a traffic circle and you see this sign that says Fort Tryon Park. When you're, when you're standing in the park looking south, you'll of course see the beautiful little subway station. There's the number four bus. Um, and, the, and the sign says the cloisters, the heather garden and the cafe, which means the New Leaf Cafe, which of course is not now closed. Uh, and it's not only because of the pandemic that it's closed, it's closed because the the operator coffee pulled out of their lease so as far as i know they're still looking for an operator when restaurants are allowed to reopen but there's a huge flock of house bows who make these these u hedge their home and i just love this picture of them all lined up margaret corbin circle is named after the first woman soldier to die in the Revolutionary War in 1776. Her husband, who in this portrait is lying dead in front of the cannon, um, operated, fed the cannon. And he was killed in the battle of, uh, on, on Fort Tryon Hill. Um, and she took his place. And so they named that circle and the drive through Fort Tryon Park Margaret Corbin Circle and Margaret Corbin Drive. She, her tombstone is at West Point and she's the first woman to receive a military pension. There's a plaque erected not only to her, but it's, it's on the east wall of the Linden Terrace. So it commemorates the 300th anniversary of Henry Hudson sailing up the river. It commemorates in 1909, um, the invention of the Fulton steam paddle and it commemorates Margaret Corbin in 1776. When you're looking north from the circle into the park, you see the stand of London plane trees. Uh, and we talked about that the other day, how they're, they're um, a hybrid of the American sycamore and the European sycamore or oriental plane tree. And the first two little trees you see are right here and here. And they are holly trees. Let me see if I can this a better. They're holly trees, and they are an example of a tree that has a male tree and a female tree. It's called dioecious, which means two houses. This is the male tree, and this is the female tree. The male flowers don't have any pistil, they don't have any ovary, they just have stamens with pollen. The female tree 
has a pistil, has an ovary that produces the berries. And this is a picture of the tree full of berries in the winter. Right inside the park is another example of dioecious trees, and these are the yews. And these are conifers, so they have cones. They don't have flowers. These are the male cones that produce pollen. And this is the female cone that produces the arrow, like a berry on the yew tree. When you first walk in, it's azalea season in Fort Tryon Park. And, oh God, it is just so beautiful. Uh, they are blooming everywhere inside the Heather Garden. They are uh, in the same genus as rhododendrons, but they're much smaller than rhododendrons with much smaller leaves. And when the flowers are out, you don't really see the leaves at all. Here's the rhododendron, which is also in flower now. So rhododendron means rose tree. Rhodo means rose dendron tree. This adorable little girl was walking with her mother. And when it got up to this azalea, the mother said, in this wonderful Irish probe, what is this tree? And the little girl said, azalea. <laughs> She's 20 months old. So, oh, another naturalist is born. Behind the azaleas, when you first walk in, are rather tall dogwood trees. Uh, dogwood comes from the Old English word dag, meaning dagger. Um, the stems are narrow and can be whittled into, into, they were whittled into daggers and skewers and uh, arrows. So that's where the name dogwood comes from. There's a little dogwood tree that's blooming now um, in the north end of the Heather Garden. Dogwood flowers are interesting. Um, everyone thinks these are the petals, but they're not. These are bracts. Uh, they're, they're modified leaves. The true flowers are here. And you can see the little anthers sticking up that have the pollen. It is the host plant for the spring and summer azure bat butterfly uh, who lays her eggs on the flower and the caterpillars actually eat the flowers. They have protection from ants. So because they're usually caterpillars are on the underside of the leaves, they're protected, birds don't see them, but these caterpillars are out in the open. And so they've, they have an adaptation where they secrete nectar or honeydew for the ants who farm them and tend them and protect them. The dogwood leaves are opposite and they have smooth edges, smooth, margins, they don't have any teeth. That's one way of, of recognizing them before, well, the flowers actually come out first. And they're one of the first trees to turn red in the fall, which is called, with, which ornithologists call flagging. Because when the leaves turn red, it means the berries are ripe. And the berry and the, the red leaves attract migrating birds to fly down and eat the berries like this cedar waxwing fly away, digest the outer part of the seed, then poop out the seed somewhere else to help colonize the plant far from the mother tree. There is a very large old tree lilac, Japanese tree lilac growing right across from those dogwoods. And it has buds now and very soon it has, it'll produce these beautiful white blossoms that smell just like lilacs, which are also blooming everywhere. This is at the very end of the Billings Lawn. Oh, it's just heaven to walk through there. When you first walk in and you look south, you'll see an enormous dawn redwood tree. Years ago, there was another, I think it was a linden tree that blocked the view. And I don't know if it was in Hurricane Sandy or after, that tree fell down and when they cleared it away, all of us volunteer gardeners said, wow, that is some tree. Don't plant anything in front of it. So they just planted low shrubs so you could continue to see the dawn redwood. This is a very ancient tree that was widespread throughout the world uh, before the last age of glaciation. They thought it had been wiped out 10,000 years ago, but then they found it tended by monks and temples in China and Korea and Japan, and people brought over the seeds. And they're being planted as street trees now, they're planted down uh, at ground zero. They get to be enormously tall. And they're what's called a deciduous conifer. 
So they actually lose their needles in the fall and then grow new ones in the spring. Here's one that's a, a, a little further down past the Billings lawn. Uh, it, they grow very, very quickly. This bark looks so rough that when you touch it, it's so soft and beautiful. And they produce cones, they're conifers. And the leaves are opposite each other, the leaf stems. All along the Heather Garden, you'll see structures like this, which support climbing vines, clematis. This is curly clematis. And then we have a clematis that grows along the fence, clematis montana. And then in this little booth next to the um, cottage, you have clematis jackmani, which should be blooming soon. This booth was built as a police booth when the park first opened. Um, uh, this is a view of the cottage, the gatekeeper's house, and Tryon Hall, um, I think in 1917 or maybe before. And, and here's the cottage today. Um, open House New York weekend is when they open the house. So this is around Columbus Day. They open the house for people. Uh, it's such a wonderful tour. You should do it if you haven't already. And this is a view of the house and the police booth looking north from the Javits playground. Walking through the Heather Garden right now, you'll see these very fuzzy large buds and leaves. And these are poppies, oriental poppy buds. And soon they'll open and look like this. It's looking down into a poppy. And here is the poppy head that will hold the seeds. And at, once it matures, it looks like this. I just think this is one of the most beautiful seed heads that there, that there are. Uh, it has these little windows or pores all the way around. So when it dries and the seeds are ripe, as the wind blows the poppy head, the seeds pour out. This is of course the opium poppy. The ornamental onions are blooming now. Here's uh, the lilacs in the background. Just beautiful onion flowers. And of course, foxglove. So the name foxglove comes from um, a myth that foxes used to put the little flowers over their paws to silence them as they walked through the woods. But foxglove is very important medicinally. It's the source of digitalis, which is used for people with heart problems, heart disease. It's an extremely poisonous plant. Another name is dead man's bells. The irises are about to pop in this picture. And I took this picture just maybe a week ago. Iris means rainbow in Greek. And and the goddess Iris was the goddess of the rainbow. They have the most interesting anatomy. Here a bumblebee is working her way in there to get to the pollen. And here a bumblebee is coming out. A bumblebee is coming out of the iris, covered in pollen. Irises have nectar guides, and some of them have these very large beards, very fuzzy beards, and that attracts the pollinators so they know where to find the pollen and the nectar. They land here, they move in, and there is the anther covered in, net, in pollen. So you have to separate the iris flower to find the stamen and the pollen, and this is part of the pistil. This is the style and the stigma. So when the bee comes in, and she moves out, the, the pollen is rubbed off here on the next flower, pollinating the iris. Look at that, so beautiful, look at those colors. Irises can spread underground by rhizomes. So rhizomes are underground stems that store food for the plant during the winter when the leaves die back because it's the leaves that produce through photosynthesis, uh, glucose or sugar for the plant. But during the winter, that's all stored in here. So in the spring, new leaves can grow out. They have lots of energy from the rhizomes. As you walk along, you'll see this little plant. These are the flowers. These are the leaves. Look how fuzzy. These are lamb's ears. 
uh, they, the gardeners usually cut back the flowers because they're grown for their ornamental leaves. Another name for this plant is Boy Scout toilet paper. Here is our beautiful Siberian elm. Um, we have American elms, Siberian elms, Camperdown elms, uh, Wick elms. Uh, the Siberian elm is one of the biggest elms in the park and it was not planted. Um, some bird ate a seed and flew over. We have an enormous Siberian elm in our complex on Broadway between 192 and 193. Um, and maybe the bird took the seed from there, I don't know. But pooped out the seed and this elm grew and the gardeners never cut it down because it is so beautiful. And below it throughout the seasons, you, you have a, a succession of flowering plants of these Spanish bluebells. This is my favorite time. I just love these flowers. Blues and pinks and purples. Here's a close up of the bluebells and forget-me-nots. And you'll, as you walk through, you'll see the columbine flowers. And one way to distinguish them, is, no matter what color they are, how tall they are, what they look like, they all have leaves that look like this. And it's a compound leaf of three little leaves together. Columbine, columbine. Now look at this. This is called a nectar spur. So the insects have to somehow have very long tongues or proboscis that will slip in there to get the nectar. This is a, a sphenix moth and she has ve a very long proboscis that can reach there. And of course the hummingbird can extend its tongue. This is a, ru a male ruby throat, uh, can extend its beak and its tongue into that ne uh, nectary to get nectar. <clears throat> in um, 1862, an orchid collector sent this orchid to Charles Darwin. And when he, Darwin opened the box and saw the orchid, he measured the nectar spur of this orchid, and it was 12 inches. And he, he, he hypothesized that there must be an insect in Madagascar, this is the Madagascar or orchid, that has a proboscis that's a foot long, and everyone laughed at him. Well, sure enough, 20 years after his death, so 40, 50 years later, they discovered this moth with a foot long proboscis, and they of course named it the Darwin moth, that could pollinate this flower. So these two co-evolved. This is an example of co-evolution. The Heather Garden has two main beds. This bed, so you're walking north, so the bed on your left is called the Heather bed because it's where most of the heath and heathers are. And this is called the perennial bed. This picture was taken in February, March, some years ago of heath flowering. So in the winter, the flowers you see are heath, and in the summer, the flowers you see are heather. This is a plant that's native to Scotland and Ireland and England. Uh, it survives on the moors. It needs acidic soil. It needs thin soil. It needs rocky soil. Perfect conditions um, th that this area provides, which is why the Olmsted brothers decided to plant heath and heather here and call it the Heather Garden. So we're looking at heath. I'm gonna tell you the difference between heath and heather right now. So heath has little leaves, needle leaves. They're both shrubs, woody shrubs. Uh, in this hand, they're holding heather, which has flowers on both sides. And look at the difference in the leaves. This is heath, this is heath, this is heather. So the leaves have little rounded scales on them. So that's one way to tell the difference. Well, actually two ways because the heather has flowers up and down and the heath has flowers at the top and the heath has needle leaves and the heather has scale like rounded leaves. Every April, of course this April it was canceled because of the pandemic, there is a celebration called the shearing of the heather. And Jennifer Hoppe, the head of the, head of the parks, of Northern Manhattan Parks is leading the parade with a bagpiper and gardeners from the 
the uh, New England Heather Society come and they shear the heather. Not all of it, just in certain places. Uh, here's a picture of the heather in the summer. You can see the flowers are up and down. This is John Kelly, our wonderful head gardener, and he's going to prune this smokebush tree, one of my favorites. The new leaves of smokebush are red, and they're red because they're filled with a pigment called anthocyanin, which protects new leaves against sun and wind. The smokebush produces flowers that from afar look like smoke. And it's also a dioecious tree. So there's male and female flowers. These are the female flowers. You can see the little berries. In the autumn, the smoke bush leaves are just so beautiful. As the chlorophyll, which we see as green, starts to die back in the fall, the other pigments like the anthocyanin are visible and carotene, which is the orange. There are many types of peonies in, in the Heather Garden. This is a tree peony, which is woody. And these are herbaceous peonies. And peonies, of course, well, they are so big. The flowers are enormous and they are so fragrant. They have many, almost infinite number of anthers. And this is the central pistil. Um, they, they bloom for such a short time, a week, 10 days, but boy, are they gorgeous. This is a really interesting plant. This is a yucca plant, and it's a plant of arid, dry areas. And so it has very thick rhizomes that are underground stems, and it can spread that way, but it also stores water in its stems. It is an evergreen. Those spiky leaves, and they're sharp, try not to touch them, um, are, are green throughout the year. Um, that's because they have an enormous amount of water to draw from. In the summer, in the early summer, they send up these flower spikes. And this is an example of a plant that also um, has only one pollinator that comes to this flower. And that is the yucca moth. It's a tiny little moth. And um, when she has fertilized eggs, she flies into the flower of the yucca. She collects the pollen and she rolls it in a ball and holds it under her little moth chin. Then she takes it up to the top of the pistil, to the stigma, and plants it there. The pollen then will help um, fertilize the eggs that are inside. But meanwhile, then she comes down here and has an ovipositor, deposits her eggs inside the ovary of the yucca. So when her babies hatch, when the little moth caterpillars hatch, they will have seeds to eat. This is a, it's called Dutzia gracilis chardonnay pearls. So Dutzia is a shrub and the flower buds look like little pearls. And here they are with um, some flocks and bluebells. And here they've opened, they're open now if you go up there. So Chardonnay pearl flowers are now open. So here's a cardinal standing right in front of a scotch broom. This is the scotch broom leaves in winter, uh, stems in winter. It's also an evergreen. Uh, the leaves are not out yet, but you can see the tiny leaf buds. And then when it flowers, the flowers are little pea-like flowers. They are, the scotch broom is a member of the legume family that produces seed pods like this with beans inside. The legume family is very, very essential for fixing nitrogen from the air into the soil. And they do that through these tiny bacteria that build nodules or homes for themselves around the roots of all legumes, whether it's a locust tree or a scotch broom plant. Um, the bacteria are able to take soil, to take nitrogen that's that's come into the soil from the air 
through spaces in the soil and fix it into the soil so other plants can use it. There's a tremendous amount of uh, nitrogen in the air, but animals and plants can't take it in and we need nitrogen. We get nitrogen from the plants we eat and animals get nitrogen from the plants that they eat. But plants get nitrogen because of the nitrogen fixing bacteria in the roots of legumes and other plants. So these are essential bacteria. Pollinators love the bloom flowers. This picture of the male ruby throat hummingbird was taken by Gabe Kirschheimer, um, one of the um, photographers of Fort Tryon Park. Um, and Gabe has a wonderful site uh, called forttryonflowers.org. And he's photographed every single flower in the park, every single species of flower in the park. And um, he posted this on my Inwood on a Facebook page. And, uh, and he sent a, this picture to Jennifer Hoppe. I've never seen a male ruby throat in the park. I've seen plenty of females. And I'm hoping that maybe they'll have a nest somewhere. Uh, but anyway, it was just a joy to see this, this beautiful little bird. Uh, honeybees love, love the, bloom the broom flowers too. Uh, and they go into the flower and they get pollen all over and they rub it together and they put it on their little pollen basket called the corbiculi and then carry the pollen home to their hive. So they'll come in here uh, this is a drawing from my book, Honeybee Hotel, about the honeybees of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. They'll come in here to get nectar and pollen. They, they are one of the few bees or uh, pollinators that bring home both. And then they carry the, they go to the next flower to get pollen and nectar. They go inside and the pollen lands on top of the pistil on the stigma. And the pollen grain has sperm cells and it has a pollen tube cell. And the pollen tube grows down to the ovary into the eggs and the sperm delivers the male DNA to the female DNA in the egg. Once that's done, the ovary then becomes the fruit and the eggs become the seeds and the ovary swells to protect the seeds and then the seeds are dispersed. This is the beauty berry plant flower and it's blooming now. There are tiny little purple flowers that look like this that surround the stem in bunches. And they produce these gorgeous amethyst beauty berries, which are loved by birds. This is the black-throated blue warbler, the catbird. Catbirds are everywhere right now. This is a, a vireo and our mockingbird. And there's a pair of mockingbirds in the heather garden that are so loud and so wonderful. But here's one eating a, a, a beauty berry. This is another plant that love, that's loved by birds. This is a shrub called Cotone ester, and it is flowering right now. It's covered in gorgeous, tiny little flowers. And some of our most beautiful birds eat those flowers. Remember last week or the week before we saw, um, we saw orioles and cardinals eating red bud flowers? Well, here's the rose-breasted grosbeak eating Cotone ester flower. And this is from my book about the birds of New York City. This is by the photographer Beth Bergman. And here's a male Baltimore oriole eating the Cotone ester flower and the female oriole. This is the rock face. Um, uh, and here's that Siberian elm looking east. And this is the rock face. This is Manhattan schist that's been worn down um, for half a billion years by glaciers and water and weather. Um, as the glaciers moved across New York City, they scored these deep grooves in the rocks. Here is a little morning dove who is looking for seeds on the rock. And here's a, just a river of, um, of creeping flocks, pink and purple, pours down. Just love it. It's still blooming. And this is called basket of gold. You'll see that all over the rocks. 
There's a close up. Oh. And so looking now, looking toward the river, you see the Billings Lawn. This was taken just the other day. Here are beautiful red oak trees. And you can see people are staying far apart from each other. Here's Billings Lawn in the winter. Not this winter, obviously, we had no snow. Uh, this is a wonderful sledding lawn and the parks department puts bales of hay around these trees and down here so the kids don't get hurt. And here's a picture, 1908, of the Billings Lawn. And um, I think that's it. Uh, I did that, right? Let me go back. Okay. Um, next week, we're going to go down. Wait a minute, why is that there? I'm sorry. Let me go back. I stopped. I, I... Hey, Marilyn. Let me just see what happened. Oh, that shouldn't be there. Sorry, sorry. Next week, play from current slide. Share. Well, I'm going to leave the iris up. But next week, we're going to go down uh, and walk, take the walk north from the Billings Lawn up past the Cloisters. So I'm going to end there. And um, if anyone has any questions or any pictures they want to share. We do have some questions that have come up in the Zoom, in the, in the chat box. Good. Um, Victoria asks, are there any of the edible dogwood berries here? The Kusa dogwood has berries that are delicious to us. And yes, and they bloom much later. They have, let me see if I can, I'll show you next week. They have very pointed bracts and they're late blooming. And we do have them in the Heather Garden. Good question. And Alicia, Alisa, um, Dave, first time photos of the flowers were in a poster hung in the 190th. You know, Anne, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Oh, okay. That's Aliza. better. That's better. Okay, great. Um, Aliza says, Dave Hirschheimer's photos of the flowers were in a poster hung in the 190th Street subway station elevators. They were. And, you know, they're supposed to redo those elevators, but now with the city so broke, who knows when they'll redo the elevators. I, uh, the, that poster was taken down, but you can find it online. And it's, a, it's just a wonderful picture of the shape of Manhattan covered in the photos of all the flowers of Fort Tryon Park. Thanks, Eliza. Did you want any, any other questions? I, I have to say hi to, to Kathy and Mark who are watching from British Columbia, Canada. <laughs> Oh, great. So good to see you guys. <laughs> this is great. So, um, <laughs> people can ask it. questions by unmuting their, their mic, too. Hi, everyone. Hi, Joanza. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Hi, Joanza. Uh, great class today, Leslie. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay, well, I hope everybody has a wonderful week. You will. Yes. And I'll see you next Thank week. You, Leslie. Okay. Can I Thank ask, you. can we have a photo session taken? May I take everybody's photos? This is the largest class we've ever had for this. Yeah. At one point, we had 20 participants. Yeah, we did. I've seen that when I was doing the attendance. <laughs> is that okay yeah. if we do that? Not yes. me. Yeah. Not me. Not you. All right. <laughs>